There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Baylis Conley. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. And now here's Bayless. You know, I was thinking that, uh, you know, we, we have this great campus here in these buildings. A lot of people don't know everything that went into the stability of what's here. There's a foundation underneath every building, and we had to put in 168 pilings. I think that the most shallow is 60 feet, and they went down to 120 feet. These holes that go down filled with cement and rebar, and those 168 of those, and listen, they were incredibly expensive. And the foundation was placed upon that because of the liquefaction factor here. Otherwise, we'd have buildings tilting and cracking and sinking. And of course, we have a little thing called earthquakes here in the Southland. And so a lot of attention had to be paid to the foundations. And we've been dealing with foundation stones of the, the early church. You could call them the, those, you know, those pillars that, that hold up the foundation of the church. There are certain fundamental doctrines, practices, and experiences that the Lord set, you know, as, as foundation stones for the early church, but they're also for the church in every generation. These aren't side issues. They are fundamental in, in, in making the church uniquely who she is. And so we're dealing with these core foundational piling stones, if you would, these things that make up the foundation of God's church, regardless of what generation it is. Today, I want to speak to you about evangelism, teaching, and healing. Are you ready? Yes. Let's pray. Lord, give us understanding today. And more than that, we just embrace the fire of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we want to be informed, but we want to be inspired as well. And it is our intent to be doers of your word, to put into practice the things that we hear. And Jesus, may you be glorified. If you agree, say amen. amen. You know, the disciples had lived with and worked with Jesus for about three and a half years. They knew what was important to him, and they knew what their mission was. In fact, just before his arrest, Jesus prays a prayer. And in that prayer, he said, Father, speaking of his disciples, Father, I have given them the words you gave to me, and they have received them. And Father, as you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And that's exactly what you find them doing as the church is born and begins to expand. They are speaking his words and they are doing his works. They are continuing to carry out the ministry of Jesus. But Jesus went on in that same prayer to say, Father, I'm not just praying for them, but I'm also praying for all of those who will believe in me through their words or through their ministry indirectly, that is every single one of us that is here today. Indirectly, believers in every generation, and we should be carrying the heart of Jesus and doing the works of Jesus and speaking the words of Jesus as fundamental and foundational and as core issues to who we are and what we are about. Now look with me at Matthew's gospel, if you would, chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And we want to look beginning in verse 35. Matthew 9 and 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, 
teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to the disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. How these passages open up with this statement that Jesus went about all the cities and all the villages doing three things. He didn't just do this on occasion. This wasn't some one-off ministry thing that, that he did on some particular occasion as led by the Holy Spirit. This was Jesus' M.O. This is what he did everywhere he went, in all cities and in all villages, teaching, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing the sick. He did those three things everywhere, teaching the word, preaching the gospel, and healing the sick. And it was deeply imprinted upon the disciples and we find all three of those same elements woven deeply into the fabric of the early church. Because, you know, just like us, they had been sent out by the Father even as Christ was sent. And I want to take the middle one of those things and talk about it first. That Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And they were busy about doing that in the early days of the church. How gospel means good news. What about preaching the good news of the kingdom? That there is new life in the kingdom for those that embrace the king. That King Jesus died for sinners, was raised from the dead, and he's provided salvation for a lost world that is spiritually separated from God. That is good news. And then it says that he was moved with compassion. You find that phrase quite a few times in the Gospels. And always it's tied to a particular action. And here in verse 38, it said, or excuse me, rather uh, in verse 36, that when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And as he's moved with compassion, when he sees these shepherdless people, the first thing that he does is he speaks about the harvest field and he commissions the disciples to pray for laborers to go into that harvest field and without you know, breaking a thought, it goes right into chapter 10, and then he sends them into the harvest fields to reach these same lost sheep that his heart is broken over and that his heart is moved by. So immediately, he tells them to pray about and be involved about getting this good news of the gospel of the kingdom out to what he refers as a great harvest field. All right, what about this harvest. Look with me if you would in verse 37. First of all, the harvest is plentiful. First thing that Jesus said, it's plentiful. Well, who's it made up of? This plentiful harvest is made up of weary, scattered, spiritually leaderless people. The Amplified Bible actually brings out some of the flavor of the original language. Listen to it. Jesus saw the people that they were bewildered, harassed, and distressed, and dejected, and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Bewildered people, harassed people, distressed people, dejected and helpless people, people without leadership. My friend, that is the harvest. I had the privilege the other day to sit down with a gentleman. I'd met him in a parking lot one day. And uh, he said, oh, you're the pastor of that church. I said, yeah. He said, I'd really like to talk to you. But I was on my way to an appointment. I said, you know what? I can't do it right now. And I said, well, look, this is where I work. I said, you know, I'll, I'll stop by and talk to you sometime. And I actually stopped by his place of employment twice. 
and he wasn't there either time. So I went by on another day some weeks later, a third time, and he happened to be there. And we had a delightful conversation. He was very, very open with me, quite articulate. And uh, he shared an experience that he'd had. He's never been to church here, but he was, you know, on the, the church campus, I think, biking down one of the lanes one day, and it was a service day. I don't know if it was a Saturday night or a Sunday, but he struck up a conversation with somebody that was, you know, walking across the crosswalk, headed into the building, and apparently he said something that, that set the man off that was coming into the church, and the guy that was coming to the church cussed him out. <laughs> and in fact, not just once, cussed him out with some very explicit terms, you know, a number of times during the short conversation. And so he went on to tell me, he says, look, I just want to know what kind of church that is. <laughs> You're pastoring. I mean, you got people right out there coming into the church, you know, treating a stranger this way. Just what are you teaching them? I said, well, you know what? I'm really sorry you have that experience, but I just want to tell you, those are the kind of people that we're after. Those are the kind of people that, that God fiercely loves. People that have been beaten up in life, that have been thrown down and stomped on by life, that are angry at the world, people that have issues, people that are broken inside, people that are carrying burdens. I said, those are the people that we're after. I said, now most of the people in the church are going to be more well behaved than that. <laughs> but I said, if, if you have a hard time with people that have issues, cottonwood is not going to be for you. And he got it, and he actually liked it. Friend, that's the harvest. Amen. Jesus is moved with compassion. He sees broken people, hurting people, distressed people, people that have been beaten up by the calamities of life, people that are crooked on the inside because they've been under so much pressure and made so many wrong decisions, and Jesus sees them as he mad at them. No, his heart is filled with compassion as he thinks about him. I think about a couple of the events we've had here. We had a famous country singer a couple of different times in the church. And we went to every honky-tonk and cowboy bar in the area and passed out invitations. And they came in mass. Hundreds of people came to Christ. And it was a great night. But I remember one of the ushers come and say, Pastor, there's all kinds of cowboys out in the parking lot. They're having tailgate parties with <laughs> cases of beer sitting out in the parking lot waiting for the concert to start. And I'm thinking, awesome. That is the harvest. And Jesus, he went about preaching the good news of the kingdom to these people. All right. The second thing he said about this harvest is that the laborers are few. Laborers, all right? What kind of labor is he talking about? First of all, obviously, it's the labor of prayer. Because he said, therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Galatia, he said, my little children of whom I labor in birth again until Christ be formed within you. He was talking about prayer. He had prayed for their salvation, and now he was praying for their maturity. And Paul, speaking about praying for people when they're lost, coming to Christ, and then praying for them to grow in Christ, he referred to it as labor. And here Jesus said, look, the labors are few. So number one, you need to pray. You know, my dad was not open to me when I became a Christian. In fact, he told me one day, he said, look, I liked you better when you were on drugs. <laughs> and you just have to understand that I was so filled with zeal and had so little wisdom when it came to sharing the kingdom, I kind of overdid it. <laughs> but he was just kind of close to me, and, and really, I'd been a jerk for a long time. And when you're a jerk that's on drugs, it gets way worse. And so, you know, he had a lot of reasons for being closed off to me. And I just said, God, my dad won't listen to me. Send somebody to him. And I remember I prayed numerous times that God had sent someone to my dad. And I was volunteering for a Christian agency one day, answering phones. And I had a name tag on. And this lady walks up and said, Bayless Conley, 
So does your dad have the same name that you do? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we do have the same name. He said, I just want you to know that me and my prayer group, we pray for your dad every week and I've been witnessing to your father and it just like opened up this whole vista for me that God, you have the whole body of Christ that you can use and my dad's salvation is not going to rise and fall on my ability to reach him. Pray the Lord of the harvest. And I don't think there's anything wrong with praying that God will send out laborers into a specific area of the harvest. I remember an older minister shared with me and some other people one day about a woman that he knew. This was her ministry. This was her life. Every day she would go into a room and she would kneel down and she would begin to pray for a particular city. She would study ahead of time and find out whether there was a Bible-believing church in the city or not. If there was not a Bible-believing church, she would get on her knees and begin to pray that a Bible-believing church would be planted and established in that city. Sometimes she would pray over the same city for months, several times. She prayed over the same city every single day for years. And when she heard a Bible-believing church that was sharing Christ to be planned in that city, she would go to the next one, and she would go to the next one, and she would go to the next one, and she did that for about 60 years, I believe. Well, you know what? When people get to heaven and they're going to get up to stand to get their rewards, and I think a bunch of pastors that are probably going to be one of them, stand up there and, as Jesus said, look, step aside. <laughs> said, Grandma, come here. The only reason you're there, the only reason you did what you did is because she prayed you in. She prayed this whole thing into existence. She prayed that laborers would be sent into the harvest. And she labored at those prayers. And you know, the local church is God's best idea for reaching the lost and for bringing the influence of the kingdom to a community. There's no better idea that God has ever had that he's ever implemented than the local church for changing society and changing the world. All right, the second type of labor is actually going and sharing the good news personally. Number one, to become a laborer, you need to pray. Pray that God would send others. Pray that God would open doors. Secondly, we need to go. Look with me, if you would, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. The, the thought has continued on. These 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, he's seen the lost scattered sheep. His heart is broken. He says, all right, you need to pray, and then you need to go to these lost sheep. And they had their specific assignment as all of us do. In Mark 16, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I know some people, for them, you know, verses like those in Mark 16 or like the verses that we've read here speaking about the harvest, it immediately conjures up images of foreign lands, strange languages, and completely different cultural practices. When Jesus said go into all the world and share the good news, it's not just going into all the geographical world, though that is certainly part of it. It's going into our own personal worlds. Going into the world of medicine, the world of sports, the world of entertainment, the world of politics, the world of education, the world of manual labor, the world of family, the world of neighborhood. You know, Janet and I had dinner this week with a couple in church. They, they have a beautiful restaurant. And it was a, a neat thing to see. We're, we're having dinner with them. But before we got in, you know, we're engaged by the hostess outside on the, si outside on the sidewalk. And they've had a great influence in her life. And she starts sharing with them, I got baptized. I finally did it. I got baptized. I feel so good. And they're encouraging her in the Lord. And then we come in. And one of the servers comes up and said, you know, from what you said, I started going back to church. And I, I, I'm involved in this small group in the church. And I'm just loving it. And one of the owners looked at me and said, this is our flock. They were just taking the gospel into their world and bringing the influence of Jesus to the people that they were with day in and day out, and we're all called to do that. 
Listen, it is foundational that as followers of Jesus and as members of the church, members of his church, that we be evangelistically minded. The church is not some sort of fort where believers, you know, hide out from the world until Jesus returns. We are commissioned and we are anointed to reach them. I have a friend. We have been close friends for many, many years, and he has a great church. I was talking to him one day, and we hadn't seen each other in a while. I said, how are you doing? He says, awesome, and how's your family? We talked about the family, and I said, how's church doing? He said, Bayless, it is so good. He said, we've been having the most awesome worship times. We've been worshiping God, and the presence of God has been coming down, and, and, and people are weeping, and it's just, it has been awesome. We have had the most amazing worship. I said, that's, that's great. I said, has anybody been getting saved? And it went absolutely quiet on the other side of the line for a long time. And he said, actually, No. We haven't seen a person come to Christ in a long time. I said, oh, and just kind of passed over it and went, went and talked about something else. Well, he rang me back about a month later. He said, Bayless, your question to me, has anybody been getting saved? He said it was like an atomic explosion. I couldn't get away from it. I thought about it day and night and night and day. And I realize it's like we've been having this little believers meeting and the presence of God has come, but we're not doing, you know, the first commission that Christ gave us. So, so we've adjusted some things and yet they're still having some believers meetings where it's just worship and, you know, they'll go on for an hour, an hour and a half and, and, and worship and the believers are there. So, but we've adjusted some things and services and I want to tell you, Bayless, we've been having some great worship times still, but it's not the kind of service it was before. And we have had people come to Christ every single week. Now, I talked to him just the other day. That was several years ago. We were sharing, he said, it has been a rarity that we haven't had a week where at least one person has come to Christ. He said, generally, every single weekend, numerous people come to Christ. Friend, there's nothing more important than that. We have to be evangelistically minded. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. Bayless will continue with part two of his message next week. I love talking about Jesus. And you know, his priorities should be our priorities because we are being conformed to the image of God's Son. Join us next week. We're going to continue this very important study. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's Word in our daily lives. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. I am sitting in the uh, Gospel Forum in Stuttgart, Germany, this you know, vacuous uh, auditorium uh, just filled with empty seats right now. Uh, but come the weekend, these seats will be filled. People will be coming to Christ. There'll be great worship in the house here. People will be encouraged. But the truth is, this house and every other church in the world, it doesn't go forward without a host of faithful volunteers. You know, it's been said that volunteers are not paid uh, because they're worthless. It's because they're priceless. And frankly, the, the, the church of God only moves forward because of the labor of so many people that work in the background. I was reading these verses in Romans chapter 16, verse six, it says, greet Mary who labored much for us. Well, who is this Mary? We don't know, but she labored much. Why would someone labor much? Because they love much. And I wonder how many Marys working behind the scenes have kept the ministry going in so many different areas around the world, here in Stuttgart, at our home, at Cottonwood Church in Southern California. It goes on and uh, Paul writes and he says, greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, 
or of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. We, we don't know anything about these guys, Andronicus and Junia. Well, apparently they were notable apostles in that day, but who were they sent to? What work did they do? We don't know. They're sort of these, these unknown heroes that uh, have had an impact for Christ in their day. He goes on, he says, Greet Am Ampilus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved, and Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household, household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Who are these people? We don't know. But you know what? Though many of them are unknown to history, they are known and celebrated among the angels in heaven because they faithfully worked for the Lord in their day. And if you're watching this right now and you may not be in the spotlight, you may not be known, you may not be the person up on the platform, but friend, if you work faithfully at your given task, you will be rewarded and applauded in heaven. He goes on, he says, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa who have labored in the Lord. Who are they? I don't know, but they labored in the Lord. He says, greet the beloved Persis who labored much in the Lord. Who is Persis? What did he do? History doesn't tell us, but friend, heaven knows. And in that day, he was significant to the apostle Paul. And I'll guarantee you any leader in the church today that has a brain is incredibly grateful for all of the people that volunteer and that hold his or her hands up and enable them to carry on, you know, the ministry in public. He goes on, he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. We don't know who Rufus was, and we certainly don't know who his mother was, but apparently the Apostle Paul, you know, treated her like his own mom. Maybe she made meals for him. Maybe Paul stayed at the house of Rufus and, and his mama sort of adopted the apostle Paul. She was very important to him. And you know what? There's some in the church, you just need to be a mama and a daddy and, and bring a, a, an arm of encouragement around some people and you need to make a meal for somebody and encourage a young person. Listen, your work is incredibly valuable. The work of the kingdom only goes forward because of a myriad of unknown heroes faithfully doing their work each and every day. God bless you. The rain just won't stop. I wish I could turn it off. I can't turn off the rain, but I can protect myself from it. It's the same with temptations. We can't switch them off, but we can protect ourselves. Pastor Bayless explains how in his CD or DVD message, Victory Over Sin. God will not leave you out in the rain. Grab the right umbrella and step into the good life already prepared for you by God, a life free from feelings of powerlessness and shame. Order Victory Over Sin by Pastor Bayless Conley now. Just use the information on screen. Victory over sin.